Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to see you all this evening. It's great to be here to worship our Heavenly Father. I'd like to invite you to stand with us and join with us as we sing of the amazing grace we've received through him. So let's sing. Great to see you tonight. My name is Matt Stedman. I'm the Senior Minister here at St. John's in Camden. As you find your seats, please turn around and greet those around you. Uh, brothers and sisters, I, I trust that we can stay around at the end of the service and continue those conversations and catching up with one another. If you are new here tonight, a very warm welcome to you. If you haven't been for a while, same. Uh, and of course, if you are a regular attender here, great to be together 
uh, tonight as we continue to make our way slowly through Mark's gospel. Uh, tonight, our kids and youth pastor, Matt Carmody, is going to be sharing tonight. I've heard the sermon uh, twice, actually, and it's a great sermon tonight. Uh, he'll also be taking your questions and comments after the sermon, so uh, keep your pens handy as you jot some notes down uh, tonight. Some of you have give, given us some feedback that you found the Q&A times uh, helpful, so thank you for that feedback, and we look forward to continuing uh, to do that. Uh, one of the questions we've had during Q&A, and something, of course, all of us, I would imagine, have thought about before, uh, is this. If God has the ability to fix an obvious problem, then why doesn't he? Or to rephrase that question, put it another way, why are some of my prayers unanswered? And all of us have had prayers that haven't been answered in the way perhaps that we would have planned. And an extreme form of that is someone to giving, giving up praying altogether. Why would I bother if God hasn't answered my prayer in this way? One pastor said this, uh, God will either give us what we ask for in prayer or give us what we would have asked for if we knew everything he knows. And I think that's a very clever way of putting it, actually, which captures uh, the sentiment of the New Testament. In other words, there are sometimes very good reasons why God does not answer the prayers that we pray, unknown to us, uh, for we don't know everything that he knows. And as Matt opens this passage up for us tonight, Mark chapter 5, we're going to see two healings, uh, two people desperately healed. Both of them are healed. But what's important for us to realize, friends, as we gather tonight, is that Jesus offers us the most significant healing from the most significant ailment any of us could imagine, which is estrangement from God. And we know that and we trust that. We read in Jeremiah 31, this is the covenant, this is the agreement I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their mind. I will put it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they will be my people. And here's the important part. For I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. And we hold on to that promise, don't we? Sometimes we hold on to our sins tighter than God actually holds on to our sins. He says he remembers them no more. So brothers and sisters, since we are confident that God does forgive us, uh, we start tonight with a prayer of confession, which will be on the screen. So we pray this together. Thanks, Ian. Together, Heavenly Father, we praise you for adopting us as your children and making us heirs of eternal life. In your mercy, you have washed us from our sins and made us clean in your sight. Yet we still fail to love you and serve you as we should. Forgive us our sins and renew us by your grace, that we may continue to grow as members of Christ, in whom alone is our salvation. Amen. God is slow to anger, and God is full of compassion. He forgives all who humbly repent and trust in his Son as Saviour and Lord. And there is now, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. I trust that we know that, friends, in increasing measure tonight. And so we stand as a church, as a family, and we continue to worship him as is his due. Let's sing King of Kings. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the one from the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise the Lord. 
Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. the kingdom coming and to reconcile the lost to redeem the whole creation you did not despise the cross for even in your suffering you saw to the other side knowing this was our salvation Jesus for our sake you died Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. And the morning that you rose, all of heaven held its breath. Till that stone was moved for good, how the Lamb had conquered death. And the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe. For the souls of all who'd come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born, and the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel, shall not fade. By his blood and in his name, in his freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one. God of glory, majesty, praise forever to the King of kings. Praise for heaven to the King of Kings. Please be seated, friends. I would like to bring a couple of notices to your attention, and then uh, the one of the wardens, Ian Harley, has uh, a notice that he wants to bring to us tonight as well. As we always say every week at our services, we have our Connect cards in the pews in front of you. If you would like to connect with uh, the staff in, in any way, uh, then that is there for you to use. Uh, most people use these to submit something they would like prayer for during the week and every Tuesday at midday we gather as a staff team, we have lunch together and then we slide seamlessly into our staff meeting and that's when we uh, pray for, for those things as well as other times throughout the week as well. So please use that. There's also opportunity to join one of our community groups or to sign up to a, a Christianity Explained course or anything like that. So you can, uh, you can use that as well. Thanks, Ian. I'm, I'm, I'm getting the hurry up here. Uh, there is a fundraiser, women's fundraiser event coming up. It's next Saturday. Tonight, this week, next few days are your last opportunity to sign up to that. Tonight, Elizabeth Carmody will be running around with the flyers. Uh, you can sign up via the QR code, which are on the flyers, but also up there. I uh, would love to know some final numbers pretty early on this week. We're raising money for Turning Point, uh, a charity well known to, to many of us here doing incredible work. Uh, and I love to 
turning point because they're doing local uh, uh, poverty relief, uh, local support, uh, and that's what, we, that's what we can do here. We can support those who are doing that work in our own community. So if you're keen to come along to that uh, for the ladies, for afternoon tea, a bunch of things going on there, please do let Elizabeth Carmody know. Uh, she was the one singing here. Where is, where is Elizabeth now? She's, oh, there she is. I thought she'd left already, but there she is. Uh, uh, make sure you find her tonight or she will find you, uh, whatever the case may be. And the uh, next one is Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, the 4th of November, which seems like such a long way away. I would love us each year to come together, three congregations, hopefully Warambri and Mount Hunter come as well, uh, come together as one church and to give thanks for everything that the Lord has done uh, in us and through us uh, during the year. Uh, I can imagine that we would have stories, uh, perhaps testimony, someone coming to know Christ, uh, someone who has been brought through a crisis, someone who's really grown throughout the year, and uh, we get to celebrate that. A venue has been booked. It's, it's Woodlands, uh, the Woodlands. Uh, Tilda, where is that again? Thank you. It's in Harrington Grove. It's an amazing venue. Uh, it was $65 a head, but an anonymous donor has given two grand to bring it down to $45 a head, which is awesome. Uh, so the reason we're letting you know how much it is is so if, uh, if there are some issues with uh, your cash flow at the moment, then you can start putting a couple of dollars away each week and hopefully we'll, we'll get there uh, by, the, by the 4th of November. So I hope you're excited by that. It's uh, really for anyone who's 18 plus uh, and uh, it'd be a great opportunity for us to, to come together and, uh, and celebrate all that God has done. I would like to invite Ian up. Uh, come on up, Ian. And uh, after Ian has uh, told us what he wants to say, then we're going to have our Bible reading with, with Tilda tonight. So Tilda, if you want to jump up straight after Ian. Thank you, mate. Now, it's really good to be involved in a church like St. John's. So much going on. We touch the lives of around 400 people a week, making us one of the largest community groups in Camden. One of the practical necessities of all this activity is that we need funds to support it. Thankfully, we have many generous people at St. John's that help us, so thank you for all of them for your generous support up to date. My purpose of coming in today was to draw your attention to the report of the newsletter. The wardens and the parish council have been struggling with how best to report back to the parish about our finances. Up until now, we haven't reported to you our actual expenses matched to our giving. We've just reported on whether or not the giving is on track to meet our expenses. It makes sense to us to make this slight change on how we report to you, particularly given the challenge that we face this year. The graph on the back of the newsletter shows you that we've been collect what we've collected for the last three months and the expenses that we've budgeted to incur. incur. <clears throat> You'll notice that we're 26,000 behind in the intended expenditure. One of the things that's different for us now is for the last three and a half years, we've not needed to meet the full complement of salaries for our full-time staff. For example, a few years ago when Mitchell Herbst was here, his salary was paid by the Defence Force as he was a trainee chaplain. And then of course, Tony resigned and we had a period without a full-time rector. You might remember that Irfan was our acting rector for a while, but he didn't take a stipend. This year, with all the staff we had, we're all working really hard, so to meet the expenses will be a challenge, and as you can see, we're falling a bit short. It's not quite as bad as the graph looks, but because we, have, we do have other incomes, but we'll need to dig a bit deeper so that we won't run into a deflect. But I'm not here to hound you. All I want to do is let you know our needs will, and we will be, leave it up to you to prayerfully think about how you might be able to contribute. We'll be reporting this in future and uh, feel free to ask any questions when you see us around. I hope this has helped. Um, tonight I have the privilege of reading one of the more awkward passages of scripture. Thanks, Matt Carmody. Um, <laughs> but the first reading is from Leviticus chapter 15, uh, verses 19 to 27. 
When a woman has her regular flow of blood, the impurity of her monthly period will last seven days, and anyone who touches her will be unclean till evening. Anything she lies on during her period will be unclean, and anything she sits on will be unclean. Anyone who touches her bed will be unclean. They must wash their clothes and bathe with water, and they will be unclean till evening. Anyone when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, saying, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she'll be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see, the people crowding around against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some people from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, came. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Tilda. Uh, if you're uncomfortable during that first reading, I understand, but uh, it's quite uh, relevant to understanding Mark 5 uh, and the plight of this poor woman. Uh, so it'd be great if you could have your uh, Bibles open to Mark 5, uh, as I'll be referencing it. Uh, a few, about a month ago, I had to get my car fixed. I'm not sure um, how you feel about cars and getting them fixed. I find it a bit, bit frustrating. Uh, and whenever you move to a new area, there's the added frustration of you've got to find a good mechanic. Because you don't want to get ripped off, you want to find someone good. But the problem is often the good guys are booked out. Anyway, uh, I asked around when I first moved uh, into Camden, okay, who should I go to? And people said, go to Eagles. Okay, cool, I'll go to Eagles. Uh, and that's where I've been getting my services done. They've been great. They've been telling me when I need to get things replaced. Um, hey, Eagles. Good to see you. Uh, <laughs> they were great. And so I was like, okay, I'll uh, take my car there and get it fixed up. I took it there. They did a service, and they gave me a report. And they said, hey, we did the service, but you should not drive your car until you have the water pump assembly fixed. Uh, unfortunately, we can't do it. We don't have the tools, but we don't have the contact of someone who does do it. Uh, you can go contact them. Unfortunately, they had a six-week wait limit. And so I'm thinking, okay, now I need to find a mechanic I can trust for an expensive issue. It's painful. And so I call up around, uh, and I'm talking to this guy, and he just sounds a bit sketchy. 
He's uh, t- talking about all the different parts he'll have to replace as if it's going to be really difficult. And I look it up, and it all comes as one part of a kit. All comes as a kit, all as a group. And so I'm, uh, okay, I got a price off him, and now I had a bit of a gauge. Called the next guy. Completely different experience. He actually asked me, what's going on? Okay, uh, he asked more and more questions to, to diagnose the issue, to make sure that he would be fixing uh, what the problem was and to give me an accurate quote. And he said, come in on Monday, I'll have a look at it and give you a price. So I took it in on Monday and he showed me every single thing he would re- re- replace and why he would replace it. And so I was like, okay, this sounds good. I'll put it in. And a few days later, I had my car working and sounding better than it ever has. Uh, it was good. A good mechanic did a good job. I didn't get ripped off. I was happy. Uh, When you trust someone to fix a close personal issue, you make yourself vulnerable to that person. On the one hand, they can solve the issue for you, but on the other, they can hurt you. They can make it worse. They can rip you off, which perhaps is even more painful. You've trusted them, and they've taken advantage of you. And so this reality makes us hesitant to trust others with our personal problems uh, until we're confident that not only can they help, but that they will help. And this is a good thing, especially in today's age of scams. Uh, If you pick up the phone and you hear a robotic voice telling uh, you that you owe money, you should be skeptical. Uh, But sometimes we take this skepticism and lack of trust in others, and we apply it to Jesus. And so we don't trust Jesus with our problems. We might trust Jesus with the little things, the little problems. Lord, help me to get uh, safely to work today. Oh, thanks, Jesus. Thank you that you did that. But we'll hesitate when it comes to the big things. Sometimes it might be because we're not sure he can help. Other times we're not sure he will help. What if he says no? And so we put Jesus in a box. We say, Jesus, we'll ask you for help for this stuff, but no further. Uh, You can't help with anything further. We'll just have to deal with that on our own. And so instead instead of trusting Jesus with our deepest hopes and problems, we try and deal with the big things on our own. So today we'll see that far from putting Jesus in a box we should actually entrust ourselves to Jesus. We should trust Jesus with the biggest issues of our lives. And the reason is because firstly, he's willing to help. Secondly, he is compassionate. And thirdly, he is more powerful than we think. We begin in Mark 5, 21 with another Mark and sandwich. Uh, Matt explained this a few weeks ago. Occasionally, Mark will have a story within a story. So you start with one story, and then you get to a different story, a whole complete story, and then you come back to the original story. And the reason Mark does this is so that we can compare and contrast the stories and try and understand a bit more about what Mark is getting at. Uh, And in both these stories, we see two people with a problem that they can't solve. They need the help of someone greater, and so they both seek out Jesus. And Jesus is willing to help. Uh, The story begins in Mark 5, 21 to the first half of 24, where Jairus, a synagogue ruler, has sought Jesus out. He's obviously seen Jesus do some miracles, heal some different people, get rid of demons. And so he tries to find Jesus when his daughter is deathly ill. But while Jesus had healed many who had been brought to him, or perhaps uh, who uh, he'd come across, here was Jairus asking for a personal request from Jesus. Hey Jesus, can you stop teaching where you are? Can you stop healing where you are? And come with me to my home and heal my little daughter. Would Jesus be willing to stop what he's doing, interrupt his teaching, and heal Jairus' daughter? And I want to express how much faith Jairus has in Jesus at this point. Uh, And we see it in three ways. The first way we see Jairus' faith is in the wording of his request. He says, please, uh, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. Uh, It was a common practice back then to put your hands on someone and pray for them. I think it's still a good thing to do today. Uh, 
but he has this added expectation. Not only will Jesus put his hands on her and pray for her, but she will be healed and live. He had faith that Jesus could heal his daughter. The second way we see his faith is that he believed that Jesus would be willing to come, that he's the kind of person that can be relied on to care enough about someone he doesn't really know that well and come and help. I want to ask you, how many doctors or lawyers do you know that you could call up, you could go to their house and say, hey, uh, I have a, a medical or a legal problem. Can you please come to my house and solve it? Do you know any? Maybe for a fee. But here's Jairus expecting Jesus might actually be willing to come to heal his daughter. The third way we see that Jairus' faith is that he thought that it would be worth leaving his dying daughter to seek out Jesus. He was at his little daughter's deathbed. He doesn't know how long she's going to last. And he leaves to find Jesus. If you had a dying daughter and you didn't know how long she had left, would you fly to Perth to speak to the doctor to try and convince them to come back to New South Wales and heal your daughter? Would you risk it? Jairus was willing to risk not being there when she died. He had faith that seeking, seeking Jesus out would be worth it. And verse 24, we see, so Jesus went with him. But on the way, we have a second story, the middle of the Markan sandwich, which brings us to point two, that he is compassionate. Verses 24b to 34. We're introduced to this poor woman's plight. She doesn't, she's not named, but we know that she's been bleeding for 12 years, which would make her ceremonially unclean, unable to participate in many of the Jewish uh, parts of culture or worship at the synagogue, and I'm sure that you saw, uh, during the, heard during the reading, how difficult that would be. Everything you touch becomes unclean. You've got to wash it. If you touch a person, they become unclean, and they have to wash themselves. It's a lot of work. And so people would avoid you for 12 years constantly without being able to touch friends and family unless you are willing to make them unclean. It's hard. This poor woman has gone through this for 12 years, and it's not just that. She's actually gone to doctors to try and fix it. And they've taken her money, but they've only made things worse. This poor woman, isolated, rebuffed by a community, and mistreated. She's repeatedly put her trust in these doctors, and they have let her down. In Leviticus, there's many things that can make someone unclean. It's not something that uh, is uncommon for them. But it made life really hard for her. And so, verse 25, this uh, woman who'd been subject to bleeding for 12 years, she'd suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of growing better, she grew worse. But then she hears of Jesus. He's passing through town right now. He's a different kind of healer. He hasn't been asking for money. Maybe, maybe she could be healed by him. But she's so socially isolated, and there's a large crowd around him. How is she going to reach him? And so she has an idea. I'll, I'll creep through the back of the crowd, and if I can just touch the edge of his cloak, if I can just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And so, even though she would touch others, making them unclean, even though she would make Jesus unclean, she was willing to pass through the back of the crowd, and she reached out and she touched Jesus' clothes. Finally, Relief. 
She can feel it immediately. Her, body, her, her bleeding has stopped. She's healed. It's amazing. And so now she also, all she has to do is let the crowd move on, and then she can fade into the background. But Jesus stops. And so the crowd stops. What's he doing? Then Jesus asked a question that filled this woman with fear. Who touched my clothes? He knows. How does he know? She was just going to be healed and leave, but now he's going to make her confess. What will he do to her? Will he make her uh, pay? Will he have her punished? She doesn't know. The disciples say, don't you see all the people crowding around you? How can you ask who touched me? But Jesus knew power had gone out from him and he was going to find the person who touched him. And so the woman, knowing what had happened, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear and told him the whole truth. Have you ever noticed that? She's afraid of what Jesus will have done to her. She tells him the whole truth. She would have told him how she'd been bleeding for 12 years how she'd spent all her money on doctors who had just made her problems worse. She would have told him how uh, she believed if she could just touch his clothes, she would be healed. And she would have told him that she touched a whole bunch of people on the way through and even touched him. They would all have to wash and be considered unclean in the evening. uh, Unclean until evening. It's not the end of the world to be unclean, but it's still annoying. Uh, Imagine if after church I was chatting with you and I had a coffee and it cooled down and then on purpose I poured it on your shirt. You'd be annoyed. And rightly so. I have to wash this now. And I'm sure you'd hold a bit of a grudge against me. What will Jesus respond? But Jesus' response is full of compassion. Verse 34. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. He doesn't call her woman. He calls her daughter, a familial term. The same uh, term that Jairus uses for his daughter, who's just traveled a far, far distance to find Jesus, to have her healed. And he says, and Jesus calls this woman daughter. And he wants her to know that it's not a superstitious belief that has healed her, but her faith in him. That she was healed, your faith has healed you. Her belief in Jesus is the thing that has healed her. And finally, he gives her a blessing go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Jesus shows her compassion that she has not received from the doctors, probably not from even her community. And now she is free. But it's just as her suffering has ended in healing that we hear that Jairus' daughters has ended in death. Verse 35, while Jesus is still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Jesus was too late. There's no point in Jesus coming now, that's what they think. A healer can help someone while they're sick, but not if they're dead. Maybe they could help if they were mostly dead, if you're a fan of Princess Bride, but not when they're dead. There's nothing that can be done. And so they think that's the limit to Jesus' power. He could have helped, but now he can't. Stop bothering him. But Jesus is more powerful than they think. Jesus is more powerful. Overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, Don't be afraid, just believe. He told Jairus, don't have fear, have faith. And we don't hear what Jairus thinks about this. His voice is silent for the rest of the story. Mark is drawing us in to consider, what would we be thinking in Jairus' shoes? How would you feel? It seems crazy to have faith right now. Your household has just told you that your daughter has died and you're meant to have faith now. But he follows Jesus home. 
And as they approach Jairus' home, there are already people mourning his daughter's death. And Jesus says something that sounds ludicrous. Why all the commotion and wailing? Your daughter is, sorry, the child is not dead, but asleep. Now, they aren't stupid. They know if someone's dead or sleeping. And so they laugh at him. And Jesus could have proved them wrong, brought her back from the dead in front of them, but he doesn't. He does it privately. Only Peter, James, and John, and Jairus and his wife see what Jesus does. He gets all the people to leave. He goes to this little girl, holds her hand, and says, Talitha kum, little girl, I say to you, get up. And she gets up. And in a very uh, human way, he reminds them she will need something to eat. Jesus raises this little 12-year-old girl from the dead. Jairus came to Jesus believing that Jesus could come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. And his belief was not misplaced. Not even death could stop Jesus. Uh, And this truth is important to remember for us as Christians. Often we think that death is the end and there's nothing after it, but that's not true. After we die, there is still things that happen. Our souls aren't gone. And who controls the place of death? It is Jesus. Jesus has the power over death. Death is not the end. It's not for our soul, not for our souls. Death isn't the limit for Jesus. By his death and resurrection, Jesus has defeated death. And so not even death is able to separate Jesus from those who love him. I hope you can see that from these two stories, that Jesus is profoundly willing to help. He's willing to help people who he doesn't really know. And surely as God's children, he is willing to help you. Also, Jesus is compassionate. He cares about us. He wants to hear your troubles. He wants to hear your problems. And he is powerful to help. He asks us to have faith, to to trust him. Do not fear, have faith. We can trust Jesus with the biggest issues in our lives. But it doesn't mean it's easy. I said at the start how entrusting yourself to others isn't a simple process. To rely on others to fix your problems. And Jesus knows that. He's not asking us to make a leap of faith that he hasn't made himself. Jesus became a man. Think about that for a moment. God became a man, something he's never experienced before. He had a mortal body. He could feel pain. And he had to trust God. He had to trust that this crazy plan of him becoming a man to die for his people, to redeem us for himself, was going to work out, that God wasn't going to abandon him. And he even goes through with this plan until he's on the cross. And at that point on the cross, he says, Father, into into your hands I commit my spirit. He entrusts himself to the Father, and his trust was not misplaced. Jesus knows that it's hard, but he cares. Jesus is willing to help. He's compassionate and powerful. We can trust Jesus with the biggest issues in our lives. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you sent Jesus uh, to live as a man, that he can understand our sufferings and our problems and that he's willing and compassionate and powerful to help. Lord, help us to bring all our uh, problems and issues before you, to not put you in a box, but to rely on you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. As I said at the beginning, we are having Q&A. The goal of Q&A, of course, is to help apply what we've heard to our lives, to clarify anything that we uh, might not have quite understood. Uh, and to even uh, go a little bit deeper in some of the things that that Matt has raised. If you do have anything tonight that you want to raise, please just raise your hand and I'll bring around the mic. We'll start with Sandra. Thank you.
Mm -hmm. Hi, Matt. Um, now I just want to know, the lady, the bleeding lady, she has been healed in front of a whole crowd of people in the village, mm -hmm. and they would know her, yep. and they would know her predicament. But when he goes to heal the little girl, he says, no one's to know about this. Yep. So why? Yeah, it's an interesting thing that happens in the Gospels. There's uh, quite a few miracles where Jesus doesn't want people to know. He tells people not to tell others. Uh, and I think this is the same reason that the parables uh, are spoken, because uh, his ministry is also hidden, because part of his plan is to die on the cross. Uh, I think if people realized who he really was, then we, they probably wouldn't have crucified him and we wouldn't be saved. Uh, and so there is this aspect of Jesus' ministry which he keeps hidden so that those who have trust in him will believe, but he also wants to actually go to the cross for us. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. Um, hi, Matt. I'm just curious. Um, when did women... Um, historically, you know, New Testament ways become clean, sort of, we don't consider that today. Yep. So obviously in Jesus' time, women were still unclean while they were bleeding. Mm -hmm. When did that change? Uh, I think it happened at the cross. Uh, as uh, the temple uh, curtain was torn in two, uh, it was the end of the sacrificial system, as well as the ceremonially sort of unclean system. Uh, and that's because Jesus' uh, blood has been able to wash us completely clean in his sight. And so we are seen as justified uh, in God's sight, fully righteous. Yeah. Just in time. Um, yeah, it's... It's often um, made me curious if the 12 years is any significance with girl was 12, lady was suffering for 12 years. Um, do you guys know of any significant connection there? Yeah, uh, I did notice the connection and I had a, a bit of a look for what other people had to say. Um, I didn't find anything definite, um, but it is interesting how many comparisons you can make throughout the entire story. Uh, if you look closely, there are very, there's a lot of similarities between the two different uh, stories, and that's one of the things that helps draw it together. Yeah. Phil has a question. How do I get to you, Phil? I might pass it down the aisle here. Hi, throughout the book of Mark, it seems that... Um, people coming or have faith, there seems to be a desperate need um, when that occurs. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to salvation like in terms of, you know, our sin before a holy God? Um, often I find that we come to faith, but there's no desperate need. How does that correlate to what we're reading about Jesus, how he heals and he, how he forgives us as well? Yeah, I think uh, what we see is those who are in times of trouble realise they need help, and so they seek out Jesus. Uh, and those who think that they're all good, like the Pharisees, oh, I'm, I'm already righteous, they don't seek out Jesus because they've already got it sorted. Uh, and I think that's why we see like, the parable of the, uh, the rich man. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God because they've got it sorted. They don't see the, the problems or the issues um, that they have with God, and so they don't seek that forgiveness and that uh, restored relationship. But these people who have the issues, the sinners and the tax collectors, they realize, I need help. Uh, and so they seek Jesus out. Any other questions tonight or comments? Thank you, Matt. Appreciate that. Uh, Nidra, come and lead us in a time of prayer. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, 
We were reminded in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 to 18, to be joyful, to pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So then, let us pray together. As God's people, let us give thanks to him for his loving kindness and watchfulness over his family here on earth, particularly over this past year and here at St John's. We also give thanks for bringing our leadership team to us as they seek to grow your family, continue to bless, guide and uphold them. By the power of the Holy Spirit, help Matt Steadman, Tim and Matt Carmody, and also to Neil, to shepherd your people, to unite them in fellowship, to unite them in prayer and purpose as they seek to lead us, your people. Strengthen them in their service for you, protect and guard them from all physical and spiritual danger, and continue to give them your grace to do all that you ask of them. In our community of Camden, we ask that you would guide our new mayor, Ashley Cagney, and the civic leadership team. Guide them in their positions of responsibility. Lead them to do what is right rather than what is expedient. Give them wisdom and discernment in their decision-making and lead them to put the needs of the community above what is politically correct. Father, we give thanks for the generosity of individuals, not-for-profit and community-based organisations, those who help the disadvantaged, especially thinking of the work of Turning Point. Thank you for the numerous volunteers giving of their time to serve the community, particularly in times of disaster and tragedy. We pray for your protection over all SES, St John's Ambulance, Red Cross, and rural fire service members. We also, Lord, give you thanks for the schools within our region, thanking you for and praying for our teachers as they educate the children each day. May they be gifted with patience, endurance, and wisdom as they cope with the stress of working in their classrooms and often having to manage difficult children and difficult situations. Father, we thank you for the schools in our community. We thank you that they're open to the teaching of your word and that the teachers encourage the scripture teachers as they come into their classrooms each week. Thank you for the fact that all the primary schools in Camden are covered by a team of committed, faithful scripture teachers who love to share Jesus with the children. May it please you, Lord, to continue to keep our schools open for this opportunity. Bless and guide Matt Carmody and Paula Wallace as they coordinate teachers, schools, and scripture within our region. Dear Lord, we lift up Anglican Youth Works and pray that you will give Craig Roberts your vision, your wisdom to lead this outreach ministry to young people. Continue to bless and provide for the Christian education program conducted among New South Wales school children. And thank you for the wonderful camping ministry of Youth Works. Thank you too for the production of Christian literature, especially the activity books for children doing SRE. And thank you, Lord, for the many children who hear the gospel through the teaching of scripture. Father, we thank you too for Youth Works College, where men and women are trained for Christian leadership with our young people. Help all who attend with their studies and give them a clear vision for their future. May your spirit empower all who teach and lecture at the college. And finally, Lord, help us to be faithful in ongoing prayer for our church and the wider community. We pray these prayers in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Verse 34 says this, Jesus said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. 
quite some words that that woman would have never forgotten, I would imagine, after 12 years of, of suffering. And it's a privilege, isn't it, to read uh, Jesus' words in the Gospels. And I trust that tonight you've been encouraged by that as we lean into the nature of Jesus, that he is good, that he is kind, that he is powerful over every ailment, including the most severe one, which is the sin in our lives and the destruction that leads that to leads to. Friends, we are going to sing about the goodness of God now and invite you to stand. Uh, we'll also be taking a collection, so if you've come prepared, uh, then please uh, give generously. Let's sing the goodness of God. is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me your goodness is running after it's running after me with my life laid down I surrender now I give you everything your goodness is running after, it's running after me. In all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. Why don't we uh, finish in blessing one another with the words of the grace. 
So let us pray together. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. Please feel free to stick around for some supper, and we hope to see you soon. One, two, three, four, love.